Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I'm pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Joseph Jaynes, author of Chapter One, The Janus Library. Joe is an associate professor at the University of Washington Information School, teaching and researching the evolution, history, impacts, and uses of information, resources, and forms. He is the creator of the podcast, Documents That Changed the World, and the author of several books, including Documents That Changed the Way We Live and Library 2020, Today's Leading Visionaries Describe Tomorrow's Library. Throughout Chapter 1, Joe Jaynes notes that relevancy is determined by how well the library meets the needs, views, experiences, and expectations of the users who access the library environment. The Library 2035 will need to align its services to match these expectations. Not doing so may be detrimental to the library's existence. It's my great pleasure to welcome Joe Jaynes. Hi, I'm so excited to talk to you today. Hi, it is always a great pleasure to talk with you, and I'm I'm delighted to be part of the project and always happy to be talking with you. Yeah, so I'm really uh, especially excited to talk to you, uh, uh, given that you are the editor of the precursor to this uh, book, that, um, when we were thinking about the vision for Library 2020, and now here we are thinking about the vision for Library 2035. Love for you to give us a brief description of what you think the future of libraries will be in 2035. Um, yeah, gosh, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people feel that way. It it feels, um, and and particularly for us to have this conversation, given that the previous edition of the book was trying to envision, you know, yesterday's library. <laughs> um, it feels like we're at a real kind of moment, and and it's it isn't clear, I think, to anybody. Certainly, isn't to me whether we are at a fairly narrow moment that we will overcome, or whether this is indicative of something broader. That things could go very differently in very different ways, pretty dramatically. Um, uh, we are an organization. Libraries of all kinds are, are an organization really steeped in tradition. We know that you know libraries go back into antiquity, and there's strong heritage for all different kinds of libraries in in North America and different parts of the world. So we are very much an organization that people know and are familiar with, and we who work in the profession and live in the profession know and are familiar with. Um, sometimes perhaps too much. <laughs> there, are, there, there are some libraries and aspects of libraries and librarianship that are still around that maybe weren't were, were a good idea at the time and not so much anymore, or maybe not a good idea then, um, and yet are really important, uh, both to the way libraries function and operate and their identity, but also how people perceive us. And there's a real need, as there always has been, but I think an increased need for, for libraries to be new and renewed on a regular basis, arguably every day, um, that the library... You know, the library you walk into, your college library, your your school library, your public library, whatever whatever organization a, a, a person, a, a client walks into, um, needs to be something that they that they get and is also kind of new and fresh and reflecting the reflecting the times and so on. Um the the moment we are at um it feels to me existential. Uh, and I don't mean to sound apocalyptic about that, but I think existential in the sense that the way the way we, and I mean everybody, librarians, library supporters, the broader communities, arguably the inst and the institutions that shelter libraries, the way we navigate the next little patch may have a lot to do and a lot to say about what libraries are and look like and are used and are perceived years down the road. It's possible that we're in a sort of hiccup um, that is transitory and and sort of of the moment. And it's possible also that this is, you know, people will look back at this as like, well, you know, 2020, the early 2020s was the point at which it all kind of, you know, turned. And um, I think when you're living in a moment like that, you just don't know. Uh, but, uh, but it feels to me like this is something um, momentous, if not, um, if not necessarily existential. So what is it that you are most concerned about as you look ahead to the future of libraries? So, yeah, um, 
I never thought I'd hear myself say this um, as someone who's been in libraries as you have for basically my entire adult life. Um, there are segments of many communities that use and uh, are served by libraries that I think have lost faith in us, have lost faith in libraries, have lost faith in librarians, have lost faith in what libraries stand for and represent. Um, and that has manifested in a bunch of different ways. Um, and, and that's what I mean is that, you know, it's possible that this is just, you know, a, a sort of blip in the, in the overall climate, a blip in the overall political scene, uh, or, you know, something has fundamentally shifted. And, and, you know, I, I used to say when I was giving presentations and talks and teaching, I would say, oh, you know, you know, say whatever you like, but nobody hates librarians. You know, you, you look at other professions and like, oh my God, I can't stand my, I'm not going to name names. I can't stand my so-and-so and these people are terrible and blah, 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 blah. But nobody hates librarians, right? Who, right, everybody loves us. Well, I don't think that's true anymore. Um, and again, whether that's not true right now or not true, you know, potentially going forward, but the kinds of things we've been seeing and, you know, book challenges and banning efforts and all of that, but like people running for library boards to eviscerate them, um, people like threatening um, uh, and and harassing library staff to the point that the staff are quitting uh, or moving or you know leaving the profession altogether. Like this is just this is unimaginable to me um, because this is this is stuff we haven't seen. You know, maybe during the McCarthy era back in the fifties, you know, with the Red Scare and things like that. But even then, I don't I, I don't think that reached into the library world in the same way that it has today. And it it's it's enormously distressing. It's very surprising. Um, it's surprising in one sense, not surprising in another, because you could say this about lots of different institutions. People are saying similar things about schools and about governments and about elections and about companies and you know lots of institutions. So it may not, I don't think it's unique to us, but it's incredibly surprising to us because it is so different and so kind of unexpected. Um, and and so how how enduring this is and how deep it is, I think is the real question. And then that, that you know, that will have whatever the answers to those is, whatever the outcomes of those things is, will have a, a substantial driving effect in like what happens next. If this is a blip, then we you know get over it and and we go back to something more familiar. If it isn't, then hmm, it's a whole different ball game and not a good one, at least from my perspective. So I think you sort of addressed this, but um, already. But my I did as you were talking, I was wondering if you did feel that there is something that libraries, librarians have um, something unique to librarians in terms of this response. And you said, well, we are seeing this across the board, yeah. but I wondered if there was yeah. something specific that libraries are, or librarians, um, why this is happening in there and what, if there's anything we can do to, yeah. to turn that, turn, turn things around. Yeah. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Um, I, I think part of this is is a very broad based, mm, a, a very wide uh, and increasing distrust of institutions in general, um, and and this has been going on for decades, and it and it erodes confidence in you know things like um, uh, schools and curricula, in things like you know. Uh, elections in things like I don't know facts. Remember when we used to have facts <laughs> that you could look up in the World Almanac and like, okay, that's the population of West Virginia, and and whatever you say, that's the population of West Virginia. I mean, there's there's moments I think we don't even have that anymore that you can't even fundamentally agree on. I mean, so if you don't have a shared reality, it's hard to have a you know coherent conversation about anything. I think we might be among the later institutions to be swept up in this. And and that speaks to the reservoir of goodwill that we have always had. Um, and, and I think that's it's easier to think about public libraries in this regard, but I, I wouldn't want to exclude school libraries and academic libraries and other kinds of institutions as well. That, you know, oh, yeah, the library's great, even if they didn't use us, even if they didn't like even know what we did. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah, libraries are good. They're better. You know, we're better off having them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in a kind of vague, sure, mom and apple pie kind of way. So we may be, you know, kind of the last wave of this that it finally gets to our shores. And now, you know, they're starting to question us. I also think it is wrapped up in a kind of, and this is a uniquely, I think, American um, phenomenon, or almost uniquely American phenomenon. So I'll speak from that perspective. This kind of, you know, retrograde, 
um, uh, revisionist kind of, oh, no, you know, that's we didn't mean that, you know, when we talked about freedom of speech, we didn't mean that. And when we talked about, you know, history, we didn't mean that. And everything is contested. And that comes from lots of different directions. So I'm not sure. I mean, there are days I think, oh, we brought this on ourselves because we didn't do enough work to, you know, cultivate support in the community. But I don't actually believe that's true. Um, I think it is the fact that we have cultivated so much support in so many ways in so many communities that it has taken so long that this has finally gotten to us, which is why it feels particularly shocking that, you know, library staff are being harassed as they walk out the door to go home or people are running for library boards to, like, close the place down or they'd rather vote to defund and close a library than to have, you know, this particular kind of materials in there. I mean, that's just nuts. But that kind of stuff is going on in lots of different places. It's playing out in school boards, it's playing out in, uh, you know, city councils and state legislatures and all kinds of places. So, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure it's, that's why I say I'm not sure it's unique to us so much, so much as the, the the train has finally pulled into our station and, and we're just not, you know, people we're used to indifference and ignorance about what we do but we're not used to hostility or not at this kind of level and and i think that's what's particularly troubling about all of this yeah well let's take a positive spin on things and i'd love to hear a little bit about what you're most excited about for the future of libraries so what i'm most excited about is what i've always been excited about in all the decades i've been in this is the people the people who um, uh, the people we serve, the people who use us, the people who work in libraries, the people who have dedicated their lives and careers to this, um, the people whose materials and resources we we collect and and preserve. So the the authors, the communities, the uh, the creating the creators. I mean, when you see some of the things that some of the innovative things that people are doing uh, programmatically, uh, service wise, material wise, collection wise, technology wise, et cetera, um, it's that is quite encouraging. And absent all the other stuff, that would be a real cause for celebration um, that we have drawn many people from uh, from a, a wide range of backgrounds, a wide range of interests, a wide range of of you know professional ambitions, and welcomed them into a profession that that is thousands of years old and occasionally feels that way um i think there's a great i think that's a great thing and the more the more of that that goes on and the more kind of innovation creativity esprit de corps more of that that we can get um uh, the better and i think that helps to mitigate some of this other stuff but you know i, I mean as somebody who's been a library ed- educator for longer than i care to remember sometimes um seeing people come into the profession and like ah. Oh, Okay, good. You you're going to be good at this. You're going to be fine. You good. Good. I feel better now. <laughs> it it mitigates some of the rest of the stuff. It doesn't eliminate it, but it mitigates it. So it's all to me it's always the people. So what do you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade? Um well the easy answer is technology, but the easy answer has been technology for like 50 years or 100, depending on your point of view. So, uh, but but I want to dismiss technology, but I don't want to overemphasize it. Um, uh, Because there's been a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff has happened. Um, Social media, um, uh, increasing connectivity. I I would also say the open access movement, which is a little bit subterranean if you're not paying attention to it, but open access, scholarly communication, open educational resources and the kind of school and and college classroom kind of thing. uh, and, you know, libraries that are creating, coll- public libraries that are creating collections of their communities' materials. Um, you know, I, I, all of that is to the good. And I think that has been, you know, transformative in a way, in ways that are obvious, like person to person, like when you're actually able to get an open access journal article or a, an open education, or, you know, a, a, an open access, online access free uh, ebook or something like that. Right. But it, it it doesn't make the headlines except in the library world. I think the other potentially more um, impactful um, uh, uh, change over the last decade has been, I would broadly say climate. Um, And I don't necessarily mean environmental climate, but I mean, although that's a piece of it too, as we know, Um, uh, the the context in which libraries do their work and in which librarians do their work. Um, On the one hand, you have... Uh, particularly in the last several years, but but not exclusively the last several years, you've had a, a much more attentive approach towards 
um, calls for social justice and equity, um, all of which are absolutely valid and long overdue, particularly in a profession that was not always welcoming of that, despite our high-minded ideals. You don't have to go very far back in the in the annals of American librarianship to find buildings that had signs on the front that told you who could come in and who couldn't and who had to go around the back door. So let's not, let's not overly pat ourselves on the back about that, although we've been better than many institutions in that regard. Um, and at the same time, you have this, no, no, you can't have this book in my in that library because somebody might be hurt by it, but I don't know who and I can't actually identify the book. But you know, that kind of thing. And and those and those are, I think, connected. You, it's hard to imagine you have the one without the other. I, I think it's much of this kind of, you know, parents' rights stuff and, and moms for liberty, which I desperately hope when somebody watches this video in 10 years, nobody knows what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> But that's the thing, right? And and it, even now, I think, and this is early 24 when this is being recorded, um, th there appears to be a little bit of erosion of that, um, you know, that their support is dwindling and maybe there's, you know, the, their feet of clay and maybe, right? But but it's still there and it's still vivid. And I think we we dismiss it at our peril. Um, so this, this and, and everything is louder and everything is more and everything is is harsher and every, right it's just this and and that's the society in general as well right the echo chamber thing the, the i don't want to talk to people i talk to that kind of stuff so i i i think the between the technology piece and the just you know hyper climate and and put any any adjective you want after hyper and you can have it hyperactive hyperbolic hyper you know whatever and and here's the library like hi we're here to help we're your community university school resource for information and fun and you know we're trying to help and right and they get kind of caught in the middle um often unprepared often um uh, unwitting or unwilling um to 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 wade into this stuff but but you know any library serves a community and if your community is like that uh, one way or the other uh you've got to respond and you've got to reflect the community and you also have to try to improve the community. This is what I've always said is that libraries reflect communities and try to improve them. And, and you can do both, but it sometimes one or the other is harder, um, particularly for librarians who come into the profession with certain sets of ideas and professional ethics and so on. Um, uh, and 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 somewhere in the middle of all of that is, you know, I, I think a really positive thing has been, a much more expansive notion of the idea of outreach. So when some of us were young, <laughs> outreach meant a bookmobile or outreach meant, you know, you went to the county fair and had a booth or outreach meant you went to the city council meeting or the rotary meeting every once in a while and you would sort of tell them how many books you bought. Um, outreach now is a whole different ball of wax and it isn't even called that anymore. Um, and I think that's to the good as well, you know, the kind of inside out library thing and, and libraries home and third place and all of that, um, which I think is an is an incredible uh, transformation of an institution that was very inward looking and like, sure, come on in, as opposed to we will go out to you in a much more authentic and genuine and, and full hearted kind of way. So those are I mean, there's lots of other stuff as well, but I think th those are the ones that are most on my mind at the moment. Um, and they're not disconnected um but they each have their own um individual and collective um impacts on the way libraries do their business and and how they're perceived thank you joe i was wondering if we uh flip that and look to the next decade what yeah. do you think will have the biggest impact on libraries as we look ahead i think we don't know i genuinely think we don't know and it's it's weird to say this, but in the 2020 book, I think the question of the future was far more tractable and far more um, concrete. You know, there was lots of, oh, we could do this. Oh, we could do this. Oh, we could have this. Oh, we got to be careful about this. But they were kind of you know, uh, and I don't, I don't want to get into the details of the specific chapters, all of which were terrific. Um, uh, but there were, you know, it was it was like, okay, the world is 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 as it is, and it's going to change a little bit. But you know, eh, and it's going to be technological, and it's going to be this and that. But but here's this one thing that I think we can focus on, and and something that I would call people's attention to. And so many things are up in the air. 
excuse me, in in the climate, in the in the world, in the way people are to each other, that I think it's very problematic. Um, uh, despite the efforts of all the other people who wrote, <laughs> I'm sure are way better than mine. Um, I think it's just uh, you know the crystal ball that I've got in the next room is pretty cloudy. And and it it rarely clears up because it feels like every day is some new wait what and, <laughs> and in a world like that it, both in the library world and otherwise in the publishing world in the uh, you know the cr- content creation world in the technology world in in the AI world I mean who knows right I mean we're just at the dawn of this generation of AI with large language models and generative AI and those kinds of things. You know, are AI is going to be the authors? Are they going to be the songwriters? Are they going to be the movie makers? Are they going to be the performers? Um, are we going to get to the stage where like certain books just can't be in libraries because if they are, they're going to burn the place down, metaphorically or otherwise? Like, I, I, there's just so much up in the air that um, I just don't know. I just don't know. And it it might be that I'm just not bright enough to figure it out or see it, but I'm just. You know, in a weird way, it all feels way more fraught um, than it would have 10 years ago um, or thereabouts, um, where where the easy answer was technology. Oh, you know, social media, we can do this. Oh, streaming services, we can do this. Oh, you know, but you can pick any any um, factor, any influence, any piece of the pie that that affects, you know, the transmission and preservation and use of information, which is what we do. Um, and like, wow, the, the amplitude of possible outcomes of this is way wider, um, than, than we might've even thought a few years ago and you add them all up and yeah, sorry. So I'm going to punt. That was a five (laughs) five minute punt. Uh, I I hope a well-reasoned, well-spoken punt. Yeah. It, it was great, but no, no, you've, I think given voice to a lot of important and concerns that, I mean, there so many things have changed. And uh, when you published your book, you didn't know there was going to be a global pandemic, for example, that was going to upend the way that we uh, did function and impacted our society so tremendously. And, you know, just one year ago, you know, generative AI AI took took off and we don't fully understand all the different ways that that's going to impact us. So certainly there are, I, I, totally understand um, yeah, that yeah, it is yeah. hard to look into that crystal ball. Well, and, and I have great sympathy for people who actually have to do this for a living. I mean, I'm just a, I'm just a <laughs> professor. Like, what do I know? Um, you're better at it than I am, but, but uh, you know, what do I know? But you know, people who have to run a library or work in a library, I mean, how many times does the deck get shuffled about AI, about collection management, about technology, about, you know, people screaming at you because you want to put a book about brown people in your library, um, uh, you know, that isn't Uncle Tom's Cabin, you know, uh, it, 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 uh, yeah. how many times can the, de- about everything, you know, uh, that, that, how many times can the deck get shuffled before you, you know, you just sort of sigh in despair um, uh, and, and think, you know, uh, I mean, one way we used to think about this, we have traditional, oh, this is a great opportunity, you know, social media, great opportunity to be more in connection with communities and share what we're doing and get get the voice of the community, et cetera, and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole lot cheaper than putting ads in the newspaper or flyers in the front hall, that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. And then it turned into a sewer. Um, and, and, and everybody's just sort of exhausted by it. Um, AI. Wow. You know, sure. Except, well, and does anybody want to read a novel by an AI? I think I've read a couple, but uh, that could have been, but like, that's not particularly interesting, I don't think. And if it is like, is it it even, is it even worth, is it even a, you know, it's, it's, it's not even human. It's so detached from human reality that it's like, ugh. So yeah, uh, I I, I have great empathy and sympathy for people who actually have to try to do this on a day-to-day basis because it gets harder by the day. Yeah. So what advice do you have for information professionals? Is mm. there, you know, looking ahead toward the future, the next 10 years, what, uh, what would you tell them? Um, uh, I would say thank you, first of all, for taking this on, um, for joining a profession that's been enormously good to me um, and continues to be an incredibly nourishing um, and satisfying. Um, I would say, 
good luck. <laughs> um, and so I'll pick up on the on, on the sort of main theme of the chapter I wrote. I, I think for anybody, but uh, but particularly for people who are are joining the profession or in or or you know coming into into the field in the short term. Um, uh, I mean, they're they're they they're a whole they're pretty young and they're pretty ambitious. Um, and they have lots of great ideas, and I think those are all assets. So their orientation is generally towards the future, which I think is great, even though it's cloudy and murky and not always pretty and, and problematic and all sorts of things. Looking to the future is the right orientation, as is a, a look back every once in a while to some of the reasons why we do things the way they do, we have done them in the past, or the kinds of things we have done and services we have provided and collections we have maintained and, and you know, organizations we have built and why. Because there is a reservoir there of professional knowledge and experience. Um, you know, at a technical level, things like, you know, vocabulary control and, and systems design and so on, but also at a at a kind of programmatic level, at a kind of institutional level, at a kind of, um, you know, ethos level. Um, and and I think finding the right balance between those, not headlong into some institution that's unrecognizable as a library to anybody older than 30, maybe that's just me, um, or one that is so stuck in the past that anybody o under the age of 60 is like, well, what's the point? Um, and that's I, this has no relevance to me and I want no part of it and it doesn't speak to me and it doesn't represent me and I, I kind of have no, you know, it's just a place to go check my email if I don't want to get on my own, uh, you know, Wi-Fi. Mm, that that neither of those is a great uh, alternative. Um, so finding the right balance between that and that's going to be different for every individual. That's going to be different for every um, institution and and uh, community. Um, which is the what librarianship has always been like. It was just a whole lot more stable and things changed a lot more, a lot less quickly. Um, I think finding that right balance and then for it for an individual. Um, uh, information professional for an information uh, library worker um where do you fit in that like what are you what are you going to contribute to this next phase of librarianship that is uniquely you um, and speaks to the aspirations that you want but also pays homage to a heritage that has gone back uh, you know dozens hundreds thousands of years depending on your point of view it can be done and i think that's a particular challenge is to you know to to get that I won't say get it right because there's no way to get it right, but to get it to where it makes sense for individuals and then collectively um, in the institution. I would also say for people joining the profession, one of the better things you can do in all the work you do with whatever community you're working with is just turn the temperature down a little bit, you know, is help people to see the other side, help people to see, and yourself, see the other side, help people to see the humanity in other people, help people to see that everything is not a crisis, that everything is not something to scream about, everything is not an outrage, everything is not, right, just, just, you know, turn it down a little bit. And if lots of people do that a little bit at a time, I think it begins to have an effect because we have so many forces that are turning the dial and making it hotter and making it worse and making it louder and making it more savage. And if we can be, we as an institution, we as institutions and we as people can like, just, it's not that bad. It's not that awful. Yes, it's bad, but like, uh, I know you think it's bad, but look at this or, you know, uh, read this, the, uh, I know it's a vain small town boy hope, but that's that's uh, but I think it's worth a try. Thank you, Joe. Um, and you know, as we think about this a little bit further, I was wondering if you could share what you think are some of the key competencies that you think librarians will need to thrive in twenty thirty five that will really help them um, prepare for their desired future. Um, yeah, so it, this is a configuration, I've given this some thought, this is a configuration of things that will sound familiar, but I think the, the way in which we go after them and the, and the relative weights of them and how we approach it will be different than we might have said. Technology, of course, I mean, that's just right. And, and technology, not only in the, you know, next best, greatest, shiniest thing, but like being a critical evaluator of technology, being a critical thinker and user of technology, um, being a critical being being someone who can help 
people use technology in a thoughtful, appropriate, soul enriching way um, is is valuable. And that manifests in lots of different ways. And right, I don't want to get too far down that road. Um, active listening and 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 active listening in uh, in a in a willingness to actually listen. So active listening, like I'm paying attention and I'm following your argument and, you know, that those things we talk about. I think active listening in a, I am willing to listen to someone who disagrees with me. And a lot of us have lost that. And I, I understand. I mean, there are days that I, that I turn off the TV or set aside the newspaper or turn off the radio or turn off the social media because I just can't take it. And so I understand that. But I also have to keep reminding myself that 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 I, I think that's another person. <laughs> sometimes it's a troll, sometimes it's a bot, sometimes it's an AI, but more often than not, it's an actual person, an actual person who feels that way. And like it or not, or however you feel about it, they feel that way sincerely. And and I would want to be taken, I would want my opinions to be taken with at least a modicum of respect. And I want to be able to owe that same duty to somebody else. So a willingness to actually listen, including to people in your community who you violently disagree with, who you think are out to get you. And that's a hard ask. But I think that's, I think that's just necessary. Um, it, it always has been, but I think that's just necessary. I would add um, political uh, savvy, and I and I I would use I would traditionally have said political with a lowercase p, but I think we now have to be more engaged in political. I, know, I, want to be, I want to say this very carefully. I think we now have to be more attentive to political savvy with a capital P, not engaged with because I think that's that is fraught as well. But at least attentive to political savvy with an uppercase p because it's going to matter. Because we are into things that are electoral and and governing in force. This is particularly in public libraries, but not exclusively. I mean, if you work for a, a state university where the Board of Regents is packed against you, they're going to make decisions about your institution and how you do your business and what you buy and what you don't buy and who you hire and who you don't hire and what you teach and what you don't teach. And, and if you're just like, la, 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 I'm a library. This has nothing to do with me. You're done. So... Um, you know, the, the typical navigating the political landscape, managing up, you know, understanding who the players are and building relationships with the stakeholders of all kinds, et cetera. Yes, all that's true. Um, and I mean, I think that's been around forever. But but there's a, you know, it, again, there's a sharper tone to that. There's more to it now than there used to be. And I think we have to, not as entities, not as, I mean, as individuals in our private lives, but, but you know, be cognizant and attentive to the capital P political stuff that's going on out there. And, and you know, thinking about it product constructively, um, I, I think it's just, I think that's just wise. It may be unpleasant and it may be, you know, difficult, but I think it's wise. Um, and I'll add one more thing, which again, I'm kind of surprised I'm saying this, is intellectual freedom. Um, uh, intellectual freedom has been one of the pillars of American libraries for a century and a half, more in some cases. Um, and it's being threatened, I think, in two ways. I think it's being threatened externally from some of the book bans and challenges, and much of which has been coordinated. I think there are also people within the library profession who are intolerant of ideas other than their own, and that's being reflected in their decisions and collections as well. And that's... It's a hard thing not to do that. You know, we're all he we're all people. We all have our own experiences. We all have our own, you know, uh, preferences and inclinations and so on. And that is, you know, collection development policies notwithstanding, you know, like, oh, that'd be, oh, I always love that author. Oh, I think more people should read this book. Right. It's a, it's a library thing. It's a librarian. I think we get it. Um, but I think it's gotten more serious than that. And I think there are people in the library profession who are frankly intolerant um, of people who think differently than they do. And, you know, as private individuals, fine, you get to be whoever you want. Um, as, a, as a library worker, I think that's beyond the pale. I really do. Um, uh, we, we necessarily, uh, except in some very restricted circumstances where libraries are only, you know, for particular users or particular communities, we have to take all comers and you have to take them at face value. And you may not like it, but... Um, but, you know, shouting down people in meetings or, you know, posting stuff on bowling boards like, no, no, you can't say that. What librarian can say that with a good conscience? No, no, you can't say that. Really? Because we've been down that road before. See the 50s and see the 2000s right after 9-11. Like, yeah, and it didn't go well. So, mm.
intellectual freedom matters in all, in in lots of ways. Well, thank you, Joe. That's a lot for us to be thinking about and digesting. And Imagine you know, what goes on in my head. For... <laughs> well, um, we've come to my last question, which I know is a little bit challenging, but I'd love for you to summarize your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. Oh, so... When I got the question, it said it didn't say or less. So I did exactly six words. Well, I, I didn't say or less. I'm a, but I'm a it's good okay boy. if you go less. <laughs> I'm a good boy. I prepared. Good for job. I'm a good boy because I did exactly six words. And this was surprisingly okay. easy. I love questions like this. And this was surprisingly easy. So here's my six words. Up for grabs more than ever. Okay. Up for grabs. That's right. More than ever exactly six words. And it gives me no joy in saying that. Um, uh, but uh, future of libraries to me is up for grabs more than ever. Um, and this can go great. This could be a great window of opportunity. Notice how I'm doing way more than six words. Um, this could be a great opportunity. There is a there is a vision of libraries that kind of overcome and navigate this current turbulence and come out smelling like a rose and like, oh, that's what a library is for. These people have saved us. They have saved our civilization. They have saved our civil discourse. They have saved our way of life. They thank God for the librarians. And there's also a future where like libraries. Yeah. I remember those up for grabs more than ever. Well, thank you, Joe Janes, for joining me today. And I just want to thank you again for your contribution to Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries. It's been a pleasure to talk with you and to hear more about your vision for the future of libraries. You've given us a lot to think about, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be in there. And thank you for attending this webcast with Joseph Janes, author of Chapter One, The Janus Library. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you again for attending.